I've been living with the Monoprice Select Mini V2 for over six months now. I ordered the V2 on its launch day and received one of the first run units, so it's possible that some of the kinks have been worked out as Monoprice has known for making small improvements from one production run to the next. So let's start with the new stuff. First and most visible is the new hot end, an all-metal E3D clone. It definitely isn't a real E3D V6, but it is an absolutely massive improvement over the V1 hot end. No more worrying about PTFE liner issues, temperature limits, or heat creep. Plain and simple, it prints like any E3D V6 Bowden setup does. Same quality, same behavior, but with one serious issue. The thing is impossible to disassemble. Malian must have assembled this with JB Weld epoxy because I couldn't get the heat break to unscrew from either the heater block or the heat sink. I was seriously worried about breaking the hot end and I decided I'd rather have a functional printer than risk pushing the limits to try and pry it apart. Second, the cooling fan for the hot end is still ducted to act as a cooler for both the heat sink and printed parts. This was a really poor decision on the V1 and even worse for the V2. The 30 millimeter 0.1 amp fan just doesn't have enough airflow to pull double duty and it still operates in firmware as a part cooling fan. This results in dangerous situations where the fan can turn off completely during prints. Heat creep on E3D style hot ends happens incredibly quickly and clearing jams from heat creep is a serious pain in the butt, made worse by the inability to take this one apart. The cooling fan isn't sufficient for printing PLA with adequate cooling for bridging and steep overhangs, and the design of the fan mount is really poor as well. Airflow is already restricted and the duct design reduces it to a level that I seriously worry about it being able to adequately cool the hot end, much less the printed parts. One simple improvement is to swap the fan connectors for the mainboard and hot end fans. The mainboard fan is always on, making it a much better connection for the heat sink fan. I plan on swapping the 40 millimeter mainboard cooling fan for a 50 millimeter blower fan and using a duct and tubing to split the airflow to provide a part cooling fan as well. The V2 also has a generic reinforced PET mat applied on top of the aluminum build plate along with a small amount of insulation under the heated bed PCB. The mat works extremely well for adhesion on PLA and PETG as is. It also works well for other difficult materials like ABS, nylon, and flex filament with a layer of glue stick applied. However, it's a very cheap addition. The mat began delaminating from the build plate after my second ABS print, forcing me to re-glue or remove it. I would have preferred that Monoprice just go ahead and use a piece of borosilicate glass with some kind of clipping mechanism. This would solve several issues with the printer that I'll get to in a few minutes. The electricals have seen a lot of improvement as well. The power supply is all new using a non-grounded outlet and it actually operates within its specifications, 12 volts, 7 amps. Unlike the V1's 10 amp rated power supply that routinely actually pulled 13 to 14 amps during operation. The new power supply should be much less likely to fail in operation and in my testing is much better built. The firmware is also much more solid. In my case, a beta version and seemingly the last revision before Malian moved to a significantly different UI platform. The PID settings for both the hot end and bed were properly tuned and accurate straight from the factory, so no more painful firmware updates are necessary. Just turn it on, load your G-code, and print. In the new UI controller, a lot of annoying bugs seem to have been fixed as well, though I've been unable to confirm this firsthand. Even more good news is that support for both the V1 and V2 will be coming built into Cura starting with version 3.2, so you guys won't have to worry as much about initial setup and configuration of your slicer either. However, it still isn't perfect. Simple things in the firmware like access limits are still missing and it's still proprietary and closed source and has no official support for updates from either Malian or Monoprice. Last on the new feature list is the mainboard cooling fan. It works well along with the heat spreaders on the stepper drivers 
and eliminates any possibility of overheating on the main board. That was a common issue with early V1s. So that's all the new stuff inside the V2. But there's a lot more to this printer. There are a lot of improvements and a lot to be happy about for sure. But this printer isn't all rainbows and butterflies. The list of problems with the V2 isn't very long actually, but they are major and they're not cheap to remedy. The Z-Rod and coupler on the V2 is the same as my later generation V1. There's not even a hint of Z-banding on this unit, but I'm sure like the V1, there will be quite a bit of variability in manufacturing, so you may still need to add some stabilizers to the Z-Rod, but hopefully replacing the coupler won't be necessary anymore. I'd still like to see a proper coupler for the Z-axis, or even better, an integrated lead screw into the Z-axis stepper motor. At the volume this printer is being manufactured, it should be cheaper to go this direction than continuing to use independent parts and coupling them together. The heated bed is still warped, just like on the V1. This negates a lot of the value of the included build mat, as you'll either need to flatten the bed yourself or use a glass sheet to achieve a level printable surface. I opted to flatten the bed on my V2 so I could make use of a build mat and fell into another world of hurt. The heated bed on both versions of the Mini uses a PCB bonded to a thin aluminum sheet. This makes adjusting the surface really easy to do. In fact, it only took me about five minutes to flex the build plate back to flat. However, if you attempt this, you're gonna crack the surface mount thermistor almost every single time. It's cheap to replace at only two to three dollars, but it boggles my mind that anyone would use a surface mount component on a flexible surface like this. If you do replace the thermistor, use a glass bead type with lead wires and glue them down to allow for flex. You can check out a future video, hopefully, on how to do this. In my case, the warping was bad enough that I had to go through this pain in order to use the entire print volume. I also had to sand down the edges of the build mat because it had a slight lip at the edges from cutting that caused it to catch on the nozzle and made leveling difficult. The stepper motors for the X and Y axis are new, smaller, and non-standard. They are still the same NEMA 17 form factor, but they have a much smaller height, usually indicative of lower torque. I didn't notice any functional difference but I worry about the longevity of these steppers over time. The printer is also noticeably louder than the original, due in part to the machining residue that was all over the Y-axis rods on my unit, but also owing to the fact that it has smaller or stepper motors. After a good cleaning and lubrication, it was much more reasonable, but still significantly louder than the V1. It's got Wi-Fi on board, just like the V1, and while technically working, it's still an afterthought with a very poor user experience and extremely limited functionality. I've been working on a solution for this for a while, and hopefully I'll have some more news about that in the near future. The included 256 meg SD card is garbage and should never be used. It is, from my benchmarking, a class two device with two megabyte per second write speeds and two to four megabyte per second read speeds. Ditch it and buy literally any name brand replacement. A 16 gigabyte class 10 SanDisk Ultra card can be had for about $10 with free shipping on Amazon. The same goes for the included sample filament. It's too little to print even the cat G code included on the SD card. Monoprice should really swap this out for cleaning filament to help with filament swaps and clearing clogs over time. But all of these issues are, while frustrating, really pretty small and easily resolved for beginners. The real deal breaker is the power supply. It is a better part, but it simply doesn't have the amperage to drive this printer properly. Both the hot end and bed each pull over six amps at full load. As a result, the printer can't actually heat both at the same time or maintain the temp of the bed while the hot end is heating up. This isn't really an issue for PLA, but for any material that needs a bed temperature over 70 degrees Celsius, you're not gonna be able to print. You can get a beefier power supply to fix this, 
the best alternative being an Xbox 360 or Xbox One power brick, which is inexpensive, but requires soldering on the correct DC power jack to fit the Mini. The V2 is undeniably a better printer than the V1. There are fewer issues, and for newcomers to 3D printing, the issues that remain aren't likely to be a problem getting started. But they are issues that limit the printer's capability significantly and can all be resolved with cost-effective solutions from the factory. It needs a much beefier power brick or a move to a 24-volt system or an internal power supply. It needs a better quality bed or a glass plate to solve the issues with warping on the print surface and a non-SMD thermistor to allow users to adjust the bed and flex it over time. It needs proper part cooling, independent of the heat sink cooling fan. Without this, the Mini isn't able to do bridging at all and can't effectively print complex PLA, PETG, or ABS objects. But that's not what we have today. Instead, we have the V2. So, should you buy one? Well, if you're only planning to print PLA and you get a little lucky in getting a bed that isn't badly warped, the V2 is, in my opinion, the best PLA printer you can actually buy for $200. It requires almost no setup, upkeep, or tweaking to produce consistent, fairly high quality PLA prints. If, on the other hand, you want to print with any other material, be prepared to spend some time and money to get there. It cannot print ABS despite the claims on the Monoprice website. The inability to keep the heated bed up to a usable temperature results in warping that will delaminate the build mat, cause massive cracks in the print, and will fail almost every single time. To unlock the potential of the V2, you'll need a soldering iron, an Xbox power supply, and a piece of borosilicate glass. The power supply will cost you $25 to $30 on Amazon, and the glass is about $20 from Go3D Print. At $275, it's no longer the incredible value that it could be, but it's still less expensive than any of the pre-assembled alternatives. The real question comes down to initial cost versus operational cost. There are many kit printers that are significantly less expensive with larger build volumes. There are dozens of Prusa i3 clones that can be had for under $150, and on paper offer the same functionality with 4x the print volume, but they all require significant time and money to build, debug, tweak, and upgrade the kits to get them reliable. There are also a handful of pre-assembled printers with similar volumes to the Mini V2, but none of them offer heated beds and are all limited as a result to PLA. So there you have it, the Monoprice Select Mini V2 a good printer at a good price that still has room for improvement. Let's hope that Monoprice gets it right on the third iteration. And please give us open source firmware. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and hit that thumbs up button and check out the rest of the V2 videos I have coming soon.